Hello, everyone, and welcome to Summer 3. We are, as always, the Iranian American Bar Association, Northern California chapter. We're a nonprofit, all volunteer organization. My name is Ali Asari, and I am on the board of IV NorCal and one of your co hosts today. Hello, everyone, and I'm Golnessa Monazanfar, also on the board of the IABA NorCal and your other co host today. As you all already sort of know, this is summer three, the third installment of the summer six program. For those of you who are new to the program, summer six is a series of programs that we developed at the IABA NorCal to help continue build life skills, career skills for all of us throughout this difficult and unusual summer. So there's six programs, each dealing with a different theme. And so thank you for joining today's program, Summer 3. Each of our su Summer 6 programs is dedicated to a life-changing theme. Today's theme, as you all know, is focus. And we have with us three wonderful guests who are our role models when we think of focus and the impact it can have in our daily lives and careers. Awesome. So let's uh, introduce them to all of you. We'll start with Rachel Williams. Rachel, you want to say hello and introduce yourself? Hi, folks. I'm Rachel Williams. I am one of the three pro bono counsel at Morrison and Forster law firm based in uh, San Francisco, but with offices around the world. Thank you, Rachel. Jeffrey, can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Hello everyone, um, my name is Jeffrey Stein and I am a public defender in DC um, who does a little running on the side. We will get to your accomplishments a little bit later, Jeffrey, and, uh, but let's, let's finish this introductions. Uh, May Samali, do you mind introducing yourself? Hi guys, good to see you all. Um, my name's May, I'm currently the CEO of the Ventures Group at High Resolves, which is an international educational organization, but actually did start my career in corporate law and did a bit of uh, work in venture capital and now also work as a professional coach in my current role. Thank you, May. Um, so just a little bit about the structure of today's program. We have an interview, a Q&A, and at the end, we'll do a takeaway summary of today's uh, with our panelists. We received a lot of feedback from the past participants that they want to join uh, after the event and have a happy hour to mingle and network with our panelists. So today, we are going to um, open it up and have a happy hour. Obviously, it's optional. And uh, keep an eye out for the Zoom link that we'll post in the chat box um, so you could join us at the end of the event. Awesome. So before we start, uh, as you all also know, we wanted to use the Summer 6 program as an opportunity to support our talented, awesome local artist community. So we always have a, a artist in residence for the, our webinar to perform live and share their talent with us. Today, we have with us actually a good friend of mine, Kian Kehani. Um, I have a story about how Kian and I know each other that we'll share later. Kian also has an actual uh, other job on top of his music career, so he has graciously agreed to donate the proceeds today to a charity of his choice. So Kian, thank you for being a role model for all of us uh, for giving back. Um, do you mind um, telling? us your name, a little bit about yourself, and then if you can get us started with a beautiful song, we will uh, kick in after your performance. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Ali, and for everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Kian Kehani. I'm a local uh, songwriter from the East Bay. Um, Ali, as you mentioned, we know each other um, from college. Um, over a decade ago now. Um, and yeah, my full-time job is I, I work in commercial banking but uh, my headspace is basically entirely occupied on music at the, at the time. So uh, it's really a pleasure being here today. And uh, yeah, I guess I can kick things off right now, right? Beautiful, yeah, go ahead. And while Kian plays, we're gonna flash a poll as we do on your screen. If you uh, take a minute to answer the question, it'll help us design sort of the rest of the program around what would be helpful to most of you. Thank you, Kian. You 
You're the one who said I ain't going back again. Running like a fugitive from the cell. And all this time thinking I was your medicine. And I was just another sugar pill. You're playing with your faith just like your father did. Bad blood, it was wrong from the start. I knew you wasted all your grace on me. A burning fire from a kid's heart. Everyone's clapping, Kian. We, I, I can hear it. My, my, my mind can hear it. Thank you so much. Uh, I know this song was from your latest album, which you just recently finished. So I would love to get into later. I'll ask you about your process for focusing sure. on how to you write your music because I know you have a process for that too. Awesome. Let's get started. We have a, a lot of things to cover. Uh, for those of you who couldn't see the poll results, uh, I think the vast majority of people indicated that they have their goals and they either need help on how to achieve them or get even more practical uh, tips because they're on their way to achieving their goals. Uh, a few people couldn't finish the focus on finishing the question, but we'll, we'll try to help all of you as well. Awesome. Rachel, I'll just start with you. Um, I worked with you at Morrison Forreston when I was an associate and I think the beginning of our friendship and relationship goes to an asylum case that I signed up to help with, which was life-changing for me. It was, it was amazing. But what I immediately loved about you and really appreciated and was a signal to me of what a great person you are was, um, you obviously had a huge heart. You loved pro bono and helping people, uh, but you had managed to carve a position out for yourself in a major international law firm doing just pro bono. And I was like, wow, I got I to gotta, I gotta learn how Rachel got to that point. So I'll start with you. 
telling us about focus and how did you manage to achieve that goal? Sure. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here with everybody. And uh, as Ollie mentioned, we, we first got to know each other when I was desperate for help on a Friday afternoon on, on an asylum case, a young man from Yemen. It was, it was, probably, it was kind of like a Romeo and Juliet heartbreak story. And, and I was just, Ali did the thing that the best thing you can do um, for your career, which is to, to say yes to opportunities and to help people out when they're in need. Um, whether it's pro bono clients or your colleagues, and I, I, I'm forever in his debt. So of course, when he asked me to join, what am I gonna, I'm of course gonna say yes. Um, and I'm happy to be here. So, so I started my career, I always was passionate about public service and, and wanted to work in the nonprofit sac sector and, and wasn't sure whether I was gonna go to law school or, or get a master's in public policy to do that. I, I ended up doing five years in in nonprofit work before I applied to law school, I went to law school, and my first um, for-profit job, uh, which I felt kind of crazy to be even applying for, was was to be a summer associate at MoFo. And I turned out I liked it. I did pro bono work. I liked my colleagues. I had a lot of loans to pay back, like many people. And so I decided to join as an associate and practice there for five years. And I knew pretty soon into it that I didn't want to be a litigator. Um, but I also loved my colleagues. I thought it was a terrific firm that shared my values. And I figured out that I just wanted to, while I was figuring out what I wanted to do, I, I could do pro bono work. I, I got trained um, to be a community mediator because I thought, well, maybe I'll head in that direction. Um, I, I did a, a kind of attorney training. I met people who were doing pro bono work. Um, and kind of made sure that as I was doing things that weren't my area of passion, I was also developing skills that were closer to what I wanted to do. Um, and I, at that point, didn't know if I wanted to stay at the firm because there wasn't a path for, for a full-time pro bono counsel role. Um, but the years went by and I got more and more experience and, and ultimately kind of uh, proposed projects that were in the pro bono space with the people who were running the program, uh, kind of train, did attorney training for a couple of years, um, and then um, kind of just made it clear to folks that this was something that I was passionate about. And I also, along the way, pulled all-nighters and, you know, did really good work, uh, even on things that weren't so interesting. Um, and developed enough goodwill that when there became an opportunity to, to, for somebody to join uh, the current pro bono council as a, as a part-time job, they thought of me and asked me to, to do it, and that quickly became kind of my full-time job, which I've had for 11 years now. So it's, it's not at all the path that many of you will take, because it was definitely all focused in one organization. Um, I thought I wouldn't be here past the summer, but I've been here for 20 years, so um, I'm certainly the, if you ask my summer associate class, um, they would have not predicted that I would be the last person there, <laughs> and, and nor would I, but I just managed to kind of find, um, uh, find a place for me, carve out a spot in, a, in an organization, and it's been a terrific chance to use the resources of a big firm um, to, to do a lot of good. Thank you, Rachel. There's so much to unpack there, and I hope well, when we come back to you, we do that around uh, um, just doing these small steps along the way that kind of puts you in a position where you were able to uh, capitalize on that, you know, that relationships and the reputation you had built. Uh, so we'll talk about that more. Uh, Jeff, uh, you, you do a little bit of running on the side. But let, let me tell our audience, you are a U.S. Marathon champion. You won the D.C. Mariners Marathon, top 10 New York City Marathon, and you just run for fun. So let me ask you, I can't run for a minute. What's focus? That's true. I've seen you run for five minutes before. <laughs> five minutes. What's focus, Jeff, and how do you do it? So it's, it's funny that you asked me to talk about focus, given that for the past three or so months, we've had you know, a one-year-old girl running around our apartment with no daycare. And so focusing is something I haven't been able to do for the entire summer so far. Um, but I think of focus as really just goal-directed action. 
It's identifying what you want or where you want to be and then doing the things to get you there. Um, and so I think, I mean, I think it's, that's sort of like the general abstract thing, but it's actually, I think, pretty easy to put into place in your own life. Um, I, as lawyers, we deal with it in, it's easy to think of it in terms of like trial. Like when you're in trial, you're focused on your theory of the case, winning your case. And so every decision you make in a trial, what question to ask a witness, what piece of evidence to introduce, you're thinking, how is this going to advance my goal? How is this going to advance my theory of the case? Um, and I think that's exactly, and that, that shapes and directs what sorts of actions you take in that trial, just like in life. You know, you want a particular job and you identify what you need to get there and then you, you take those little steps to do it. Yeah, yeah, that's, it's easily, it's easier said than done, Jeff. So we'll, when we circle back, I'd love to hear more, like how, how do you do it? Like, how do you get over those voices in your head that say, no, or I'm tired, or, I shouldn't do it today. So love to unpack that more. Let's hear from May for a second though. May, uh, you're another force of nature. I've seen you over the past 10 years um, do so many different things including running, you're also a, a, a daily runner. Um, what is focus to you? Yeah, so great question. Um, I, I think focus for me is, is slightly broader than perhaps Jeff's definition in that it, it is usually directing your kind of energy, resources, time towards a particular outcome, but it might not even be a particular outcome, it might be towards a particular mission or something that you know you're passionate about. And I think focus is not only having a sense of where you want to be, but in the present moment, being in that moment. Um, and so whilst focus is forward looking, um, minute to minute, it's in the present. And it's about getting the present right in order to get to that future point. And so that's where I think kind of mindfulness um, becomes really important in terms of keeping yourself on track. And Ali, you know, some of the old points around like the voices in your head, um, being able to take every present moment as it is. And I, I really kind of relate to Stephen Covey's quote where he says kind of the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> and that's actually much hard, you know, harder <laughs> to do in real life than, um, than, than we think. But I think part of the, the challenge is really knowing what you want, um, knowing what's important, and then the rest is tactical. And I'm, I'm happy to kind of get into the sort of what are the tips and tricks, but, um, from the poll, it seems like a lot of our uh, audience members have done the hard work of actually knowing what they want. And, and from, from what I've seen, that's actually much harder than the implementation. Um, and, and I think being mindful of your energy is, is really important. And what I mean by that is often we're focused on something, but we're, we're off track. And that's a data point about perhaps we're focusing on the wrong thing. And it's not just about getting ourselves um, back on track. It's about listening to if I'm not, if I'm falling out of focus, is that perhaps the wrong goal? Or is that the, is that really my passion? Um, and I say that kind of not just theoretically, but when I started in the law, um, my passion was really empowering people, giving people a voice that didn't have a voice. And, and that's what attracted me to law school in the first place. And whilst that became a tool in my toolbox as a corporate attorney, um, I quickly found that I had to, I was procrastinating a lot and I was, um, you know, similar to Rachel, I was doing a lot of pro bono work, every opportunity to work with um, social enterprises in the community. And I had to stop and think for a moment, um, what's my main thing? And I realized the main thing I wanted to do wasn't my nine to five or, you know, as lawyers, your nine to 3 a.m. <laughs> it was something quite different. Uh, and so ha having those moments to pause and think about, am I actually focused or is my, is my end mission and outcome changing? Um, and if so, am I, you know, do I need to change the direction of my ship? That, that also becomes really important when thinking about focus. Thank you, May. Um, so I want to ask some follow-up questions from our panelists, and I'll start, start with Rachel. Um, so Rachel, you mentioned that you always wanted to do pro bono work, and you started out doing that and then realized, obviously, like all of us, we have loans to pay, student debt, so we need a job that actually pays for it. So you switched your, I don't want to say switched, but you focused, you 
perhaps took your Sold out, I think is the word. <laughs> yes, uh, to another company so um, you could pay those bills. So you, and then you mentioned, which I loved what you said about, you have to find your place and create that space where you are. So for, for people that, um, and we will go back and forth on this, but you knew what you wanted. So you just try to create that in the next uh, place you went. But what about the people that don't know where, where, what they want actually, and how to get what they, to realize what they want and to create that space when they get to a company, for example? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think it sounds like, again, as May said, that most people have a sense of what their passion is. I, I think that in some ways that's the easy part. It's if you, if you don't um, feel joy in what you're doing or energized by what you're doing, um, maybe you can figure out uh, a way like Dion has done to, you know, you have a job that pays the bills while you're focusing on your passion. That's, that's a great um, option for people. And the hard thing is when that job becomes a, an eight to 3 a.m. job and then you don't have a chance to, to focus on your passion. So I've seen a lot of people leave the firm because they don't have that kind of balance. And that's, um, then they end up, I mean, Ali, you, you have a much better schedule, I think. We've talked about this in your current job and that allows you to do all kinds of other things that, that, are, that you're passionate about. So that's one option is just to, to kind of do both of those. But if you're trying to find it in your work, I mean, I've seen, uh, I've seen hundreds of attorneys, you know, come into the firm and leave. And so I have, and many times they talk to me about while they're there about kind of how they can get closer to their goals. And it, it, it's a lot of it is just thinking, well, I, I know I want to do some kind of public interest, but I don't, uh, I don't know what. And so then maybe we can brainstorm about how to do different kinds of pro bono matters to, to see, well, do you like to be in court? Do you like to do impact litigation? Do you like to work with social enterprises? and kind of figure out, put, make a list together of data you can collect by doing projects that are available to you in your current environment. Or, you know, talking to people, going to uh, nonprofit events. If you're wanting to know um, what areas of law might be a better fit for you, um, just get out there and sign up for committees and, and do things that get you out in the, in the world. And then you'll start making connections and getting a sense of, um, of what other people do and getting a sense of whether that's the right fit. If you're focused on whether there's opportunities to grow within the organization, then it's just kind of doing your best work, talking to people in the organization, volunteering for committees or starting committees in the organization to just to show that you are the kind of person who can take initiative and do things well. Um, and then there may be opportunities to, to switch your roles within that place. Perfect. Thank you for that. I um, particularly want to point out on this, on the part that you mentioned that you should talk with people and let them help you as well, which I think it's really important because sometimes when we're just focusing, we're all focusing on ourselves and not knowing that we're part of a, of a larger uh, community. So thank you for that. And my next question, I want to ask Steve a um, uh, question. Is he available? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Jeff. Sorry, why did I say uh, Steve? Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Just insert generic white guy name here. It's fine. Yes. Um, Steve, so we, I mean, all of you guys talked about um, how you create that focus and uh, what to do to get to that focus point, but how do you push through when you know your goal, you're focused, and I think, uh, and I, I believe Ali also mentioned um, something about your, your running. So you done marathons and Ali ran for five minutes. I can't even do five. So how do you get to that point of like not giving up? And when do you know that you're almost there, but you should still push through being lazy and uh, get to where you want to be? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the, mo the most important part um, to achieve that is, is, the, is the threshold question of like, what are you focusing on? And it sounds like from the poll that most people in the audience have done that and that I mean that is frankly the hardest part as long as you, if you can answer your why focusing on it like figuring out the how is is so much easier um and so I mean 
running for me, it's funny because like now that's become such a part of my identity, but it really, it started as, and still is to this day, sort of my time to, to unfocus, which I think is a really important counterpoint and like counter moment to your focusing because you can't be on all the time. Nobody can be on all the time. Um, you need time to decompress. You need time to or at least focus on something else. And that's, that's how I started with running is it was just such like a natural reboot. Um, and so it sort of evolved as I, you know, as I focused more and more in my day job and I felt like I needed to increase the amount of time I didn't focus in the running, um, the running became its sort of own undertaking in itself. Um, and I mean, in a lot of ways, it's just, it's like therapy for me. It's, you know, it's like, it's reducing you to your most human elements. You're putting one foot in front of another. That's, that's something that is like, you know, you can focus on that. It's, it's concrete, it's limited. Um, it's very different than walking into a courtroom where the words you say or don't say could help determine whether someone spends the rest of their life in a cage. Um, so, you know, I think, I think the two sort of takeaways are, you know, know your why, because if you do, everything else will follow. And then um, find time to, to focus on yourself through doing something that doesn't require as much mental strain. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so the takeaway from that, I would, I would assume it's okay to let go sometimes. It's not just okay, it's essential. Perfect, thank you. And uh, my next question I want to ask May, um, so given what Jeff just said and what you mentioned about being mindful, I think it all comes together. So how would you say for someone that doesn't know if, if it's time to let go or if it's time that they should be 100 thousand percent committed and just pull through so how do you differentiate and and manage your time like that yeah it's a good question so i think inherent um in the idea that we should un unfocus or rest or you know even how we phrase it whether it's pushing through procrastinating inaction laziness um they come from a particular frame of reference and i think it's actually important to unpack that so when that happens, a few things might be going on. And I think three different scenarios could be happening there. And rather than being hard on ourselves, like let's get curious about ourselves. So the, the first thing that could be going on is that actually, and this is related to what Jeff was saying, um, one of your dimensions of wholeness, like if you think about human beings as, as having, you know, eight dimensions of wellness or wholeness, it's your physical, your emotional, mental, intellectual, occupational, spiritual, financial, you know, the list goes on. There might be one of these buckets that's in the red, that's like iPhone battery wise, below 20% about to die. Um, whether it's not getting enough sleep, whether you're in crisis emotionally, whether, and so that can actually impact our ability to focus on our goals and getting kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? before we start dreaming bigger is super important and not to underestimate the importance of, um, you know, getting outside and getting fresh air and going for a run, um, having kind of social uh, relationships, being able to look after our bodies, our mind, our heart. Um, and so I often find if I'm not focused, I'm lazy. It's not because I'm lazy inherently. It's because I probably haven't slept much for the last few weeks. And that's super important and get a couple of nights good sleep. I'm like, Oh, May's back in action. <laughs> the second thing that could be going on when you've got this inaction and laziness is that it's a data point about where your passion really lies. As I mentioned earlier, um, for me realizing that I was constantly, when I was a corporate lawyer, I was Googling, I was like hiding, shutting back when we had no, not open door um, policies, <laughs> we could have our own offices. Um, I was like looking up startups and innovation and it felt like I was doing something really naughty. And, uh, and uh, you know, looking back now, I'm like, God, how long, it took me a few years before I realized like that's actually because it's my passion. I want to work with startups, um, not because it's something that I need to hide behind closed doors and being able to tap into that moment and over time, notice patterns like, where do you get your energy? When do you come most alive? Um, you know, that feeling of being in flow where you just forget to eat and sleep, not because you're like, oh my God, I have to get this paper in, but it's just, you love what you're doing so much that you lose track of time. Like that is, a, um, that actually might push us in a different direction where I think if we're getting lazy about a particular goal, it's because it's no longer the right goal. And let's rethink our goals and reset them. And then I think the third thing that be, can be going on if we're not acting is that it might be the right, like we might have got our Maslow's hierarchy right, 
we might actually have the right focus and the passion, but we haven't operationalized habits and tactics that allow us to achieve our outcome. And so that's where process goals become important. You know, having outcome goals are really important. Like, you know, if I might want to win the DC marathon, I will absolutely not, by the way, I used to be a hundred meter sprinter and the fact that I can run any more than that right now is, is a miracle. But say I wanted to, to do that, uh, or, you know, let's take Jeff's goal. You got to break that down into process goals. And so rather than kind of thinking, oh my God, I, I want to win the marathon, that's overwhelming for even the best of us, right? So it might come down to every day I want to jog five miles or three miles, or I want to improve my time this much. And having KPIs week to week, day to day, um, that allow us to be able to tick off process goals and make things habitual. So tapping into the neuroscience around like, we can actually rewire our brains to want to do habits that we then don't need to actually exert energy to do, whether it's fixing our sleep, whether it's um, becoming more fit, whether it's actually practicing emotional resilience. And I find that it's kind of, it's fun to often just A, B test different things on yourself, experiment. Like what um, tactic can I use to ensure that I am um, going to do 20 push ups a day? Or I want to be able to do half an hour of writing to produce a book by the end of the year. And you might test where, where that works best in your day and have kind of process goals along the way. But I, I think kind of to your point, um, inaction or laziness or, or lack of drive is not, I, I fundamentally um, don't think it's because human beings are not motivated. I, don't, I think motivation is kind of BS, frankly. I think it's actually about not being able to identify whether it's because something else is wrong in our lives, whether it's in fact the right thing to be focusing on or because we actually just need help with tactics. I, I, I thank you, May, for pointing that out. And I apologize for using the word lazy earlier on. We did use it a couple of times. You're absolutely right. There is something not, that has not clicked yet. There's immense potential. And that's the, the key is that. And focusing on things like laziness and motivation is actually the easy way out to not address what really is going on. I love that. We have one minute, so much more to cover. So um, I'll start, great segue, May, um, and then I'll ask May, Jeff, Rachel, 20 seconds, one tip, you will share practical tip. But May, before you start, you mentioned KPIs. Some of our audience may not be familiar. If you spend a few seconds explaining that too, that's awesome. Sure. Sorry for the acronym. So KPI is a key performance indicator. So it might be, you know, what's a specific quantitative outcome that you can measure to track that you are on your way to winning goals at the marathon. It might be that your time is improving, improving week to week. Um, in terms of one practical goal, a uh, practical tip, uh, Ali, I think one tip that I um, have used every day uh, there's an amazing woman called Mel Robbins. She has this uh, rule called the five second rule. The idea being that if your brain, if you want to do something, it takes five seconds for your brain to kill that idea unless you physically get up and the kind of uh, the physiology of moving towards that action allows us to actually achieve it. And so if I want to go to bed or get up in the morning or exercise and I have that idea, I, I get out of my chair within five seconds to ensure that it happens and I never look back. And it sounds so, super simple, but it's a good book I'd recommend as well. A quick way to operationalize some of the things that we want to get done day to day. Love it. Love it. Jeff. Yeah. Um, write it down. So when I was training, I had a goal time. I literally wrote it on a post-it note and put it on my laptop because that's what I looked at every day. Um, and it just reminds you, it reminds you of your why, it reminds you of where you're heading. And then when you hit those, those, those moments where you're having to struggle, where you're having to be resilient, where it might not be fun in that moment, that it reminds you why you're doing what you're doing and it becomes a lot more feasible. And I would say this is maybe a step above, but a broader, but, um, but just to not, not burn your bridges um, wherever you are in life, that, that kind of encompasses just being kind to people. But, uh, but I've seen so many people who don't like the current situation they're in. They, they had a bad experience on a particular matter or something, and they, they just, they're out. And, uh, and I've been there long enough in, in, the, in the world long enough to know that you know, things come around and, and just having, uh, developing kindness, assuming that people, assuming the best of people, uh, and just 
handling a situation with um, kind of with dignity and and not anger can can get you a long way. Beautiful, I love it. Thank you all so much for sharing. Uh, let's take a short break. Kian's gonna play us another beautiful song. Uh, all of our attendees, if you see at the bottom, there's a Q&A button. This is your chance to submit any question that you have to our panelists. So please, while Kian is playing his song, uh, go ahead and submit the questions and we can all see them in real time. Ava Marie, that I don't deserve this. But you take me back to what I need. In the company of something I was born in. And Ava Marie, and I don't deserve this. Ava Marie, we're always changing And I'm not the man I thought I'd be This bar keeps playing teenage anthems Ava Marie, you're a godsend distraction could you stay a little longer till the sun comes up and I'm good to drive? Could you move your body closer? Ava Marie, I can't face myself tonight. Was this expected? A stranger with an empty plea. In the accidental term toward redemption. Dave and Marie would have no exception. Could you stay? Kian, so you, you and I met because uh, I used to, when I was in college, I used to teach a class on the Iran. UC Berkeley has this great program where as a student, you can teach a class if you get the right signatures and jump through the right hoops. And um, as I was phasing out and graduating, these two bright students approached me, one being you, uh, to take over the class, and the other one is being our current IABA NorCal president, who's in attendance today, Amir Abadi. So obviously both of you blossomed. Um, and so 
a few months before COVID, we had dinner, all three of us had dinner together and you were about to go embark on writing your latest album. Yeah. And you told me this story that was absolutely blew my mind about your process. I'd always thought musicians, you know, come up with an idea just randomly when you're showering and then you write a song and this is how it happens. But you told me you actually have a very uh, disciplined process where you rent out a place out of town, you go and you stay for as long as it takes to write your album away from your wife, away from your house, and just kind of lock yourself in and yeah. write your album. And so if you don't mind sharing that, I found that fascinating. And I think it's so good for us to hear your perspective on focus. Yeah, no, we can definitely parlay that into a topic about focus. And so for me, I'm comfortable speaking about this uh, in a creative sense. Obviously, you have uh, a number of accomplished individuals here who can speak about it as a legal career trajectory perspective. But for me, um, focus is, is the way I can analyze it is my approach to, to writing songs. And Ali, to your point in that experience that I shared with you, Focus is immersive to me. It, it to me, it, it's actually just immersion. I don't, I don't even like to re refer to it as focus. Um, and so, for me, when I when I write songs um, specifically and music in general, uh, you know, I don't write off of uh, intellect or an ability to synthesize words coherently. That, that's really not who I am or how I operate. Uh, the catalyst for me is always emotional, and I build my focus around that. Um, and I, I do think that's a unique perspective. And so what I mean is that when inspiration strikes me and I'm in the right emotional space, I have to submit and I have to succumb to the moment. Um, and... I, I have to focus on an idea and build every layer out from that carefully. Um, so you mentioned that um, prior to recording this, this album that I'm going to release in a few months, um, I rented out um, an Airbnb up north and I, I knew that I had a number of songs, but I knew that I didn't have the right songs and the songs that I had written weren't ready. And I told myself that I was not going to leave until I wrote some songs that really resonated with me and I thought people would enjoy. And so I literally just locked myself in that Airbnb for um, a few days until I felt comfortable getting in my car and driving out. Um, you know, Ali, you know me pretty well. Amir knows me pretty well. I have an extremely obsessive personality. And I just want to kind of pull down the veil here and be as honest and transparent as possible. Um, I think it served me well uh, in a number of facets in life, uh, particularly music, but it, it's been a disservice in others. But um, for me, my focus is obsessive and borderline fanatical. If that means I have to lock myself in a room or a house, and kind of pull the torment out and transpose that into words and songs, then that's what I'm gonna do, you know? And I hate to sound like the uh, tormented artist type, but that's really been my experience for the last, you know, 15 to 20 years. Um, as you're, as a you're a handsome, tormented artist, Keon. Thank you. Do that. You, you use that word, Nami, but thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, Kian, and uh, thanks for your comments as well. We have a lot of uh, good questions uh, that are that that have been asked, and I hope we could get to as many as we can. Um, I want to ask this uh, question from from May. It um, our one of our audiences asked that he uh, or he has a great job in big law. Um, but it doesn't work with startups and his passion is in startups. And since you kind of had that switch, uh, we want to know how did you get the courage to leave the security of the job you have? What was the process and how did you um, let your firm know? All very excellent questions. <laughs> I'm going to try and be brief. Um, first thing I'll say is that uh, making pivots and taking leaps becomes easier the more we do it and you start to develop muscle memory in your legs the big, the, the jumps become the landings become more secure um, and I say this because at the time I remember moving practice groups was like 
a, you know, the biggest deal in the world. It was such a controversy. I wanted to move from litigation out in the same firm and I can't put, looking back, it's, it's a joke, right? And so at the time, we think that these decisions are big. Um, now, this might sound existential, but I, I read this beautiful kind of um, memoirs of people that were on their deathbed and the things they that they said they regret the most are not the things they did, but the things they didn't do. Um, and so I, I, I kind of have lived life according to that principle. And I, I would ask kind of in five years, is this decision that big? Why not try it? Um, I think we often have more security than we realize. And there's always, we can always go back, but if we don't go forward, we don't even know if we, we want to continue to go forward, right? And so to take that leap in the first place, I think having a support system around you is super important. I look to people who had, um, tr you know, taken a path less trodden, was inspired by kind of uh, contrarians, if I can even call it. Leaving law is not being contrary, but it felt like it at the time. Um, and mini pivots help you get to that out end outcome. So going from being a corporate lawyer to say being an investor in startups, in, you know, I was in Australia doing that in California, felt like ridiculous. So what did I do? I did a mini pivot. I was in policy. I went and did my master's in public policy, it's similar to law, um, technology policy. And then I used that to go and do some research about, um, you know, accelerators and then slowly moved into investing and then now work with entrepreneurs. And so you know, benefit of hindsight is 2020, but at the time I knew what I loved and I was able to visualize it and I was hungry for it. And then looking for opportunities to move slowly out and being honest along the way, I, I was surprised that, that the partners I was working for wanted me to be happy. And if it meant living a life that's different to theirs, so be it. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm a little impartial to this question. So that's why I want to specifically ask that uh, from Jeff. Uh, how do you deal with setbacks? Uh, somebody has written that I want to run a marathon, but it took a week off uh, and of running and ate a whole pizza. That's my daily struggle too. So I, sh I share that as well. Um, no, I, th I think that's a great question. And I, I mean, I think to sort of take a lot of May's message and package it into the title of a book that I read by a runner, run the mile you're in. So this, I mean, you can take that in a literal sense. In a marathon, you don't start off thinking like, oh, I'm going to win this. You start off thinking, I'm going to run this first mile relaxed and calm, and then you build throughout it. Um, as someone who's been injured repeatedly, um, you know, when you miss a week, the first thing you want to do is jump back. Um, and you want to come back hitting 100%. Um, even if you're not necessarily ready. And the idea is you run the mile you're in. So if the mile you're in right now is that you are injured and you need to recover or that you just ate a pizza and took a week off, you don't resume exactly where you left off because you're just going to injure yourself. You're just going to prolong that period of inaction. You focus on what you need to do in that moment. And if in that moment you need to recover, you need to gradually build, that's what you have to do. And, and I think a lot of times in running and just in life, um, we feel like if we are moderating ourselves so as to avoid overdoing it, whether physically and injuring ourselves or mentally and burning out, um, we feel as though we're like underperforming or not maximizing our potential. But what you need to realize is in that moment, your job is to do that exact amount, not more, not less. And so I think just remembering what your goal is in that moment, if it's to get, if it's to heal, if it's to recover, that's what you need to be focusing on not just picking up and trying to scramble to make up for lost time, because then you're just going to end up doing more damage to yourself. Perfect. Thank you. And I think it is not a bad thing. <laughs> I'll try to tell myself next time I'm grabbing another slice after a whole pizza. Um, and um, uh, the next question uh, for Rachel, um, which I think um, you could answer this best. I mean, all of our panelists are amazing, but uh, one of our <clears throat> attendees has asked that uh, they are a, a new, they're new to law, they're in second year, they're doing their summer internship, and uh, they want to know what are there some resources or ways we can start um, getting through our growth. To, through, to our goals and narrowing, narrowing them down? Well, it's hard not knowing. I'm, I'm happy to hang around in the after, you know, the after party, <laughs> the, the networking spot to talk more specifically. It's hard not without knowing what your goals might be. Um, 
so how would I answer that question? I mean, it's just talking to people. There, it's so fun. You know, people who have law degrees have do so many different things. You, there's all these different experiences right on this call, um, and so just talking to people is is the best option. Um, but I think to, I, I might need to know more specifically, or maybe you can share in the chat what you what you might want to do. Um, okay. Sure. And so let me let me ask this um, other question. It says that now that we've been all in quarantine and we are working from home, mostly in a confined space to say, how do you keep the focus? How do you not lose it, so to speak? I mean, for me, that's that is it's a challenge because it's really been uh, incredibly a, a ton of work. Uh, uh, there's just incredible demands in the, the world right now for pro bono legal help and then there's also a, a huge surge of interest among our lawyers of people who want to help um, and just a lot going on but and it's exhausting but I, I to me it's it's always about kind of why am I doing what I'm doing and 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 how who are the people and the organizations who need help and so it might be the DACA clinic that we did on Tuesday you know which was had a totally different feel than the DACA clinic that we did a couple weeks ago before the Supreme Court's decision came out um, or it might be the call that I had earlier this week with some folks um, who are in Louisiana doing uh, you know trying to fight mass incarceration and uh, they're just there doing their jobs and we were able to figure out um, you know, how we could help them do their work um, better when they are just overwhelmed with all the needs. So it's, it's getting, and I've seen this constantly in our lawyers, people who go spend a, take, you know, a couple hours away from their busy, busy day to go volunteer at a clinic um, and have that interaction and they leave energized even if they thought that they could never get away from their hectic job in order to do that. So it's, it's figuring out what, as May said, kind of what gives you energy, what gives you um, a feeling of, of, of passion and of doing something good and then just getting back to that place. Perfect, thank you. If we have uh, time for one last question, do we have time? I will ask um, one last question from uh, bringing back to, to May. Um, and, and another, we have so many great questions, but this one particularly spoke to me and we are all lawyers. I mean, I, I assume most of our attendees are lawyers or passionate become uh, lawyers. And we are type A's perfectionists that want to make sure everything's done um, to the T very correctly. So how do we defeat that? How do we get over of like letting go and wanting not to want to be the perfectionist and, and bringing back the energy and focus on what should needs to be done? Brilliant question. Um, I often joke that I'm a recovering lawyer slash reformed type A, but the tendencies come back to, <laughs> to haunt me. So you're ne we're never fully reformed. Um, look, I think it's such a good observation that perfectionism can be the enemy of the good. And I think I want to touch on something kind of Jeff has touched on throughout, which is this idea of being in the moment and being present with whatever you're at. I think sometimes we think perfectionism leads to happiness or actually the outcome that we want. But the reality is that um, in life, we're often juggling 17 balls. And the question is not, how do I juggle 17 balls? It's which of the 14 that can drop and it doesn't matter, and the three that I want to hold on to. Good personal leadership is knowing these are the three balls I don't want to drop. And so I would say kind of letting go quite literally and metaphorically is super important to be focused and to keep the main thing the main thing. Um, and what I've found is that uh, letting go often means, so saying no to things creates space to say yes to the things that really matter. And it becomes about quality over quantity. So um, experiment, try not giving your all to something that doesn't have to take all your energy. Like sometimes you just have to get something done and you will respond to that over time. You will get used to getting things done but moving your energy into the things that really matter to you. And a book that I'm currently actually ironically reading is called Letting Go. Um, and I would highly recommend that it. it's this idea that it's gonna be okay. And in fact, as Jeff said earlier, 
letting go of some of the things that we're super obsessed about that think bring us extrin extrinsic happiness or our extrinsic motivators um, allow us to focus on the things that might really bring us happiness like and personal fulfillment whether it's our social relationships or whether it's our health and and i would encourage us to not focus on making one thing perfect but make sure the various buckets of our life are in the green and no one is in the red if one is at a hundred percent and you're perfect in your intellect or in your emotional but the rest are down here that's that doesn't serve you either so thinking about it holistically i think is the way perfect thank you so much what lovely chat this uh this was so so amazing i loved it um i'm gonna summarize there's so many takeaways i tried to put as many as i could in the chat and thank you others did that too uh five main takeaways um, and I would love to write these down and distribute these because I, I want to have these on my desk. Uh, number one, always volunteer on a Friday afternoon. I had a boss that told me as a young uh, lawyer, the two assets you have is enthusiasm and availability because you don't have knowledge or anything else yet. So always volunteer. Number two, I think it's the most important one. Focus on the present, not the future. Focusing on the goal actually detracts in the moment from what you need to do right now to get there. As Jeff said, run the mile you're in. Number three, ask for help. Talk to people. So the question, the first question about pivoting to startup, I'm always pro talking to your employers or colleagues about you not being happy, you wanting to try different things. A lot of people feel the same way as you and don't, don't say it. So once you start that conversation, it just builds momentum, you hear from different people, you learn about avenues that you didn't even know existed, jobs that you didn't even know were out there, and you won't find those out without talking to people. Four, practical tips. We got three awesome ones today, some book suggestions that I will uh, distribute after this call, but uh, the five second rule, I loved it. Write it down, love it, and be kind. Don't, don't burn any bridges, great advice. And then finally, making leaps and pivots become easier the more you do it. I love this one, May. Uh, last year, this time, I was in agony. I was a seventh year associate um, on the partner track, all of that, um, you know, clients love me. I just, was, I just wasn't happy all the way. And I had to take this leap of faith to take this other job at Clorox. And boy, was I lucky. But also, I've grown so much as a person uh, in the past, just even six months as a person, as a lawyer, that just looking back, it's a complete no-brainer. I'm so happy I did it. Um, I, 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 I love that. Uh, and I'm going to be less scared making the next leap because now I have this confidence. Uh, beautiful. We're running a little behind. So, uh, Kian, I'll turn it to you. You play the closing song. Uh, I'll thank some people really quickly. This is like the Oscars. Before Kian plays, i got to finish. Um, thank you, of course, our, our guests, beautiful talks today. Um, IBA is doing a lot of other things. We'll put that in the email so I don't take the time today, but we're giving out scholarships this summer. We have summer four coming up on July 9th. Join us for that. Uh, we have a whole wellness week planned, the week of July 13th. There is going to be free yoga class, free meditation class, free nutrition class, um, and we're going to have some speakers that's uh, for all of us to to think about our wellness. Um, and then, Kion, as you play the last song, uh, we're gonna put the link to the Zoom happy hour on the chat box because it's gonna be a meeting where you all can see each other. Again, totally voluntary. Um, I got my glass of wine ready. Uh, grab your glass as Kion's playing. The moment you click on that Zoom link though, you'll be leaving this room. So, uh, so do it towards the end of Kion's song and then we'll, we'll, whoever's joining, we'll see you in the happy hour. Thank you so much. Kian? Kian, you're on mute. Uh, uh, so sorry, brother. Perfect. <laughs> Your mama suitcase, heart of a runaway. You brought along the demons who convinced you not to stay. 
A little harder on me That cross around your neck You found another victim Just like you always planned You've done seeing Teenage silhouettes The kind that grew old Damaged history, the first time it's told that ain't lost no more. And that ain't lost no more. The dog kept you moving, destruction in your blood. The chemicals were flowing as we burned ourselves to dust. Delighted by the addiction, as fucked up as it seems. One track blinded vision to keep myself from going clean. And I'm seeing teenage silhouettes. Kind that grew old. The damaged history, the first time we stole, that ain't us no more. That ain't us no more. It's what we were, backseat experiments. Parking lot cigarettes and what we had, it doesn't make any sense. Are you raising someone's kids? Aren't you born again? We're recovering middle class town. Are you in? I'm seeing teenage silhouettes. The kind that grew old. The damaged history. The first time it's told. That ain't us no more. And that ain't us no more. And I'm seeing teenage silhouettes. The kind that grew old in damaged history, the first time it's told that ain't us no more. That ain't us no more. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kion. Thank you all. Goodbye and see you later. Bye. Thank you, everyone.